practice makes perfect. And the crews manning the bombers of the United States Air Force constantly practice their jobs. Jobs they will have to do if they are ever ordered to retaliate against an enemy attack. Of course, the men, the planes, and the weapons must be constantly and instantly ready to go. But even readiness is not enough. The crews must be so highly skilled in bombing that they can fly halfway around the world, penetrate any kind of enemy defense, find targets they have never seen before, and drop their bombs in the bullseye. To attain this skill, Strategic Air Command bomber crews practice constantly. They fly long training missions within our own country, practicing navigation, air-to-air -air refueling, electronic warfare, evasion of enemy radar, target acquisition, and finally, the bombing itself. Of course, in these practice runs, no bombs are actually dropped. On the ground, near the pinpointed targets, are fixed radar bomb scoring sites manned by SAC specialists who track by radar the exact paths and altitudes of the bombers and who plot the airplane's path over the targets. These SAC radar specialists also beam radar and electronic defenses at our bombers similar to those an enemy might use to detect and confuse them. When an aircraft releases an imaginary bomb, it flashes an electronic signal and the scorers know exactly where the release occurred. The exact position of the bomb strike is computed from the point of release. A fixed RBS installation is excellent for scoring normal training missions and for evaluating a crew's bombing skill the first time they make a run against the site's target complex. But the radar navigators in the bombers are truly professional. They remember so much about a target area after only one run over it that a fixed radar bomb scoring site loses its value as a test of skill. SAC bomber crews have to practice hitting different targets in different places. Moving a fixed scoring site to a new location, however, is impractical. Each move involves too many people, too many dollars, and too much equipment and time. The only transportation large enough to carry an entire radar bomb scoring installation on a permanent mount is a train, and a train can be moved to a new site at comparatively small cost whenever necessary. This idea for a radar bomb scoring train, known as the RBS Express, was born in 1960. Borrowed Army hospital cars were remodeled to house command, administration, operations, and maintenance. Because the RBS express train was to go mostly to remote and sparsely populated areas, it had to be self-sufficient, and a personnel train was added. In February of 1961, only six months after it was requested, the first RBS express was in service. And by the following August, two more RBS express trains were in service. Before an RBS express moves to a new location, the Strategic Air Command must find a railroad spur long enough to park it, and it must be in an area which is suitable for tracking bombers on long, low-level approaches. A low-level bomber approach must be selected that will avoid populated areas, and it will be well away from established air traffic routes. The plan is submitted to the Federal Aviation Agency for approval and for the control of all other air traffic in the area. When all concerned agree, the Strategic Air Command negotiates with the railroad which owns the spur and rents it for the period of time it will be needed. SAC surveyors then compute from geodetic positions the exact geographical point of the future train location. And from this point, all necessary target information is computed to the exact foot in distance and to one-tenth of a degree in azimuth. The actual targets, two or more, may be from three to twenty miles away from the train, and usually are only coordinates on the map. When the train arrives, RBS men from fixed sites, who have been assigned to serve 45-day tours, are already there. 
Normally, each RBS man serves two such tours a year. They first make sure that the scoring radar is centered exactly over the surveyor's marker. This assures that all other equipment is also properly positioned. They release the air cushions, which have helped the shock absorbers protect the delicate electronic gear in transit. The scoring radar is leveled and made completely stationary by using attached jacks. Antennas are swung into place and installed. Hoists for each antenna are built into the flat car. Inside the vans, consoles and other electronic gear are readied for use. The train's communications systems, radios, interphones, and telephones are placed in operation. Commercial telephones and teletype lines are connected to commercial trunk lines, and all systems are given a thorough operational checkout. The train is usually ready for scoring within 6 to 12 hours. Inevitably, local residents come out to watch and ask questions. The RBS Express is often the closest association these people will ever have with the United States Air Force. From the commander to the lowest ranking airman, these men are carefully selected, highly trained specialists pursuing important Air Force careers. And past performances show that they do a good job in promoting understanding between the local residents and the Air Force. The economic effect on communities is good too. Many of the products and services which the train needs to supplement its own supply of food, water, and diesel fuel are purchased from local businesses by the train commander or Air Force procurement agencies. Besides explaining the purpose of the RBS Express to the local community through its civic organizations, the train commander, with approval from his headquarters, holds open house at least once during a train stay in the community. Then, hundreds of people are likely to come from miles around. In the personnel section, called the live aboard, each man has a comfortable roomette. There's room enough for him, his clothes, and personal effects. But it is small, and space must be used ingeniously. For example, the desk is on the bottom of the bed. The commander's room is only a bit larger, but it does have a permanent desk. Life aboard the RBS Express is not luxurious, but it is comfortable, and basic needs of the officers and men have been carefully planned and provided for. Forward of the sleeping car, there's a recreation car. Most current magazines and books on its shelves are furnished by major Air Force libraries. There are stereo tape and record playbacks with plenty of music and the television set. You have heard about a PX and a BX. Well, this is the TX, train exchange, which sells almost any basic item the men may need. A pull-down screen and a projection room allow presentation of commercial and Air Force motion pictures for entertainment or classroom instruction. The dining car is bright and pleasant. There is a dining area at one end and a modern compact cafeteria toward the center. The food, purchased mostly on the local market, is high quality, plentiful, and well prepared. There are refrigerators and freezers for food and tanks for water and diesel fuel that will sustain the train for three weeks. Finally, on the live aboard, the generators can put out half a million watts of electricity supplying all of the section's power needs and more. Each car in both train sections has its own heating and air conditioning units and septic tank. On the work train, a box car is the workshop for the train maintenance crew, and it has all the equipment needed to keep things train shaped. 
Oil and water supply tanks in the work train take up a car and a half. And half a car is the supply office. The ready room car has facilities much like those of the recreation car on the personnel section, and it's often used for conferences. The offices of the train commander and his staff are grouped together in one car of the work train section. Up the corridor, there's more office space and a dispensary area. One medic aboard treats minor ailments and has immediate access to local hospital and doctor's facilities. Operations and communications share a car with a plotting board of the S-band radar system, which backs up the scoring or X-band radar. These radios are used to communicate directly with the incoming bombers. The observers use information from the scoring radar to determine mathematically where real bombs would have exploded and to compute the scores of the bombing crews. There's an enclosed corridor from the operations car into the X-band radar van, which is mounted on a flat car. In the power car, diesel generators produce better than half a million watts of electricity for the work train. Generators of both train sections together could supply all power needed by a city of from 1,500 to 2,000 population. One of the two vans on the next car simulates an enemy's facilities for jamming or confusing electronically the radars which are in the bombers. The jammers operate in conjunction with the S or X-band radar, which is housed in the other van on the car. There, the equipment simulates an enemy's tracking radar. Finally, the van on the first car has equipment which simulates many types of radar or electronic devices which an enemy might use to detect our aircraft and their courses. At the very front of the train is the antenna of the acquisition radar. This radar is the first to detect incoming bombers. Under train rules, scoring personnel are available 24 hours a day. Normally, the train gets ample notice from higher headquarters that a scoring mission is scheduled, but often it is given little warning. Sometimes the exact mission time is not known to the scorers. More often than not, missions begin in the early morning. As the first bomber approaches the target area on schedule, it is first picked up by the acquisition radars. It shows up as a blip on the large scopes. Everyone is further alerted by a radio call from the aircraft. The S-band tracking radar operator sweeps the sky manually. Then he zeroes his antenna in on the aircraft. This is lock-on, and the plane is now tracked automatically, just as it might be tracked by an enemy's radar. The electronic warfare officer in the plane must detect the lock-on within seconds and counter-jam it immediately to break it, or, in theory, his aircraft is destroyed. His reaction time is scored. At the same time, the electronic warfare man in the plane must also detect signals from the train which simulate other types of enemy radar or electronic skier and in turn counter jam or evade them. In all cases, his effectiveness is graded. Meanwhile, the jamming equipment which is tied into the train's S-band system is sending out signals automatically to block the radar navigator's radar picture of the target area. This tests his ability to see through the jamming effects and to bomb his target. The primary scoring radar, X-band, is also locked on the bomber and is tracking it for the run. The track is duplicated on the plotting board. As the plane approaches the first target, 
the radar navigator starts a high-pitched tone, 20 seconds before bomb release. The trace determines the plane's ground speed and direction at the instant of release. The drop on the second target is recorded the same way. Bomb the way. In the other end of the operations car, a secondary S-band radar plotting board draws a backup trace for each run. Insurance in case the primary radar fails. The data is computed using ballistic factors by operations personnel who score the bomb run. All of the air crew scores are compiled and prepared for transmission by teletype and mail to the headquarters concern. Bombers can be scored at eight minute intervals across an RBS Express. Scoring periods may last from 8 to 20 hours. Two RBS Express trains normally score the bombing runs of routine training missions. A third train scores the bombing runs of Operational Readiness Inspection Test Missions, ORITs. This test results when SAC inspectors surprise a base and make their ready crews show what they can do on short notice. This third train also scores runs of evaluation missions called Bar None. They are similar to the ORIT missions, but the scoring is spread over two days and involves more aircraft. The men who serve aboard the RBS Expresses are among the best in the Air Force. Their devotion to duty, their versatility, and their professional competence all contribute to effective teamwork and to better understanding between military men and the civilian populace. The RBS Expresses are among the U.S. Air Force's best peacetime tools for evaluating the on-target skills of its bomber crews.